And in case it's not obvious, spoilers for the MLP movie. Hello, I'm Lux Brush, fresh from a night, semi-fresh from a night of watching a wonderful movie. And I'm Ember, still recovering from sitting in a theater without being able to touch the ground. And this is our thoughts on My Little Pony, the movie. We should probably add 2017 to the end of that. Yes, because there were other My Little Pony movies. Yes, and we got to watch it with the Sack Brony group. It was awesome. And also we did a little bit of traveling to watch the movie. We got to watch it with a few other bronies who most of them know we do these recordings, but we didn't ask um, anyone's permission to share names or anything. So we will credit commentary that came from other theater goers, but we will not provide names. Some ponies are kind of shy. Ah, so on to the actual movie itself. Wow, I thought the series was colorful. <laughs> But this thing is bright and colorful, well, until Tempest shows up. <laughs> also until they leave Equestria. Mm, then things get very dark and very tones of blue and grays and blacks. Until you run into the sea ponies. Yes, who aren't really sea ponies. So hippogriffs are now canon, but apparently sea ponies still are not. Can't wait to see Silverquill's video on this now that his species is officially canon. Mm-hmm. And I hope a lot of what happened in the movie actually continues into the series, like season eight, because this movie was written, from what I understand, to be between season seven and season eight. So it would be nice to see the events of the movie actually incorporate and reflect into the series, you know, so that it's actually part of the series canon universe, unlike the first U.S. Power Rangers movie, which was basically all by itself. And then, oh, we're still going to give them these zords and these powers, but we're going to do it in a completely different way, and none of the stuff in the movie ever actually happened. Yeah, I think it's mainly because the movie was based on the series they were bringing over next, but they did a lot of unique stuff with it that they actually couldn't bring into the TV series, especially those suits they were wearing in the movie, because they had to repair them, like, between takes. Yes, and they were absolute custom fit, so the actor and the stunt double both had to have separate suits. Not that I necessarily would want to share a costume anyways, but still, mm -hmm. they were actually custom. But they could have just skipped ahead and still had those zords and everything instead of coming up with a separate story of how they got them. But back to My Little Pony and back to the start of the film, I like how we actually started out with background characters talking about the festival coming up and getting to see more background stuff going on in the foreground. Yeah, so the only thing was those two ponies said they had trouble booking a stable. Canonically, hotels have been called hotels. Mm. Especially in Manhattan. Well, maybe they're called stables in other locations, or a stable is a lower version of a hotel. Oh, kind of hotel-motel sort of thing? You never know. No, and interesting to open with a filk song. Yeah, that was interesting. I did not expect that at all. It's like, okay, that's, that's cool. <laughs> was not expecting that as the lead in. No. It is nice that we heard an instrumental version of the MLP song a little bit at the beginning there with the logo. And even though the Friendship is Magic rendition uses part of that introduction, the way it was arranged sounded more Gen 1. Hmm. And I really liked how everything looked. It was just, not just colorful, but shiny, well put together. Though there is a lot of CG used for the background, so sometimes the ponies have a tendency to stand out from it, compared to blending in with it. And it's nice that we got to see a bunch of ponies, because the CMC were there, um, Apple Bloom was there, especially when Applejack was around. She's part of the CMC? I was splitting them out. Mm -hmm. I'm, I was pointing out how Apple Bloom was more obvious than the rest of the CMC. And yeah, the beginning of the movie was well put together. It flowed well. And I like how everyone was rendered in this new style and new software. Other than the eyes being large, the other change I really noticed to the eyes was everyone seemed to have like glitter in their eyes. Not quite as much as Gen 1 glitter ponies, but mm. it looked like somebody threw glitter in their eyes. Specifically the main six. I didn't really notice 
that in the eyes. I just noticed that some of the lighting looked a little flat on s some of the main six, and that they used a whole lot of close-ups. I think that's one of the reasons the eyes felt so big, because they used a lot of close-ups in this compared to the TV series. TV series are usually like a, only like a quarter to a third of the frame. These guys were like a half of the frame. They were zoomed in so much that sometimes the top of the heads were cut off to get more of the face in there to probably show off the new animation system for the face, because there was a lot going on on the faces. They could do a lot of little tweaks to emotion and stuff like that. Like how in the series, the mouths are usually just opening and closing to indicate talking. In this series, they were actually forming vowels and <laughs> stuff like that. You could actually see lip puckers and the mouth movements. So the first part was really nicely done. I like Twilight and how she's like her usual self of like, ooh, ooh, I set up this big thing. What am I going to do now? It has to be perfect. Ooh, the princess is like my idea. I really want them to like my idea. They just shot me down, but it's so cool. I just can't believe that was her idea. You want to take the amazing magic of raising the sun and moon and use it for lighting effects for a singer? I think it's because she really wanted to make it super spectacular because she wanted her first festival of friendship to be a really big thing. And she doesn't realize that the fact that it's already a big thing because the whole city of Canterlot is filled with all of these ponies and interesting that we got a different incredibly popular singer that we've never heard of. I thought we might get Countess Coloratura back. Hmm. Well, considering the new singer is also voiced by an actual pop star, that I think that's why we went with it, because they wanted another star name to add to the roster, and she happens to be really big right now, and the pony is quite stylized after her. Hmm. I mean, the way the mane was cut and everything, how it drooped down in front of the eyes, that's kind of a big thing in one of her videos. I figured it was modeled after the actual singer. As you can tell by this, I don't follow a lot of music pop culture. Yeah, me either. I know her from Osmosis and her being mentioned in other things, but overall I don't keep track of her performances and stuff like that, so I don't know her name. You know, we're not really familiar with her work. So what did you think of the beginning of the movie? Any nitpicks, any stuff before we move on to... Oh, those are the clowns I ordered! <laughs> those are definitely not the clowns I ordered. No, it flowed really well. We got a lot of nice shots of how everybody was there. I don't remember seeing Starlight, but I specifically remember seeing Trixie, which means Starlight had to be right there and I just didn't notice her. Yep, she was just in the background off to the left. Right. Also, cheese sandwich. Yay! Awesome! Pinkie Pie says his name. Mm-hmm. Basically, the small ones of Cheese Times is gonna love this! <laughs> yes, and I just would think that Pinkie Pie would be better at building party cannons than that, because that execution didn't go over very well. Not only the cake didn't seem like it was fully cooked. Yeah, that's kind of what she said. I think she also called it the Easy Bake Cannon. Mm-hmm. Calling back to the Easy Bake Oven, which I can't believe is still a thing. Yeah. I don't know if they still use a light bulb for the actual cooking element. I don't know. They might. Yeah, it would seem to be the cheapest, but that particular type of bulb is heavily being phased out. Mm-hmm. I don't think they could actually put a low-grade heating element in there. Not and have it be, air quotes, kid safe. But callback to Children's Toy that it's the Easy Bake. There were a lot of callbacks in this to a lot of different children things and adult things. Well, it's always fun every time they get to fit in the phrase My Little Ponies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I go back to CinemaSins. Roll credits! <laughs> every time the name of the movie is mentioned, he <laughs> goes, Roll credits! Because there was specifically one point when the cat guy goes, My Little Ponies. I'm like, Roll credits! <laughs> Yeah, that whole first part was a nice lead up. And my theory of Tempest being yet another former student of Celestia was totally thrown. She has a nice little backstory to find later, but there's more to her backstory that I want to know. Yes, out of all of this, I want to know more about Tempest specifically. You know, okay, we know what happened to her horn, 
and we know she left, but how did she hook up with the Storm King? How did she figure that this was the route she wanted to take? Mm hmm. I want to know more about the Storm King himself, how he ended up rebranding himself to the Storm King, because apparently he was known as something else before then. And they may be actually doing a whole connected thing because there were comics released that had backstory on all the characters that we were introduced to on the in the movie. Mm. So I may have to find copies of those. Entirely possible. And that's interesting because something similar was done with Pokemon the Movie 2000. In Japan, they got the comics that gave you more backstory instead of trying to fit it into the film. So that might be something we can look up because we have friends we can borrow them from. And going back to that Philk song real quick, I wonder if that was just done to add it to the soundtrack. Might have been. But now back to the movie and the grand introduction of what's actually our main villain. Yes, you would think it was the Storm King. From the trailer, I thought it was Tempest. Because she's the one sh shown him a more villainous aspect, even though we do see the Storm King. He doesn't come across in the trailer as the top villain. He comes up with like a side character, and the way he's treated in the movie, he's more of a, he's, I think he's supposed to be a joke overlording villain who manipulates things behind the scenes and doesn't show up until the end. Though saying that reminds me of how they were making fun of modern technology with magic spells in there, and I think that was just slightly overdone. It was kind of fun. The potion bottle was basically ringing and Tempest is like, answer it! Pour out the potion into the cauldron and... Which way? I never remember where I can look at the spell. Your Excellency, to your right. To your right. To your other right. You could even... <laughs> I just realized that could actually be a reference to space balls. Also, never call me on this wall. It's an unlisted wall. Also, the connection breaking up. Oh, yeah, magic service is really bad around here. Should we call him back? Do we have the princess? No. Then let's not call the boss back! Also, we kind of... She may have actually a little bit got away. Just a tiny bit. I'm glad he's not as annoying as I thought he might be. He's not in the movie enough to really have time to be that annoying. He is a good villain sidekick, though. I do like the little thing of like the fact he always has food. Yeah, he's a good villain sidekick. Seems more loyal to Tempest than to the Storm King. Though, I, I have to wonder how long the Storm King has been the Storm King, because the pirates specifically refer to him as the Storm King. So, how long has this rebranding been going on? Hmm. And is it basically that, oh, I did rebrand myself, but it's not going well. We need to up the ante. Yeah, and speaking of upping the ante... How long has that staff been around? Considering it uses the power of four alicorn princesses, when historically it was two, and then more recently three, and only in the past couple years, four. Yeah, I'm almost thinking that Tempest basically took a crystal that can absorb magic and use to control magic, stuck it on a stick and gave it to him, and then planned to take it away from him later. Well, the question is why ever give it to him, except that he implied that he was the one who could restore her horn. So if that's something he could do, you would think he could do it before he got the staff, if he was dangling it in front of her that whole time. That he had the power to do so, but simply wasn't going to. Because if it was the staff that would provide the power, then why not charge the staff before he shows up, restore her horn, and then take him out right then. Because if he had the power all along, then she needed to play along. If he wasn't going to have the power until he got the staff, why ever give him the staff? Just, Tempest is such a more interesting character, but I still want to know about the Storm King because he's interesting because he seems so shallow. Because the question with him is, how is he in charge? How did he get in charge? How is he managing to manipulate all these people to have them serve him? Mm -hmm. Was he like more powerful in another way before he got the staff and he immense all these soldiers and that's when he ran into her? I almost feel like she was like fighting in some type of an arena or something before she met him. Yeah, I kind of want to say cage fighter. Yeah, because she knows all these martial arts and... 
she can shock people with her broken horn and... And those type of skills aren't really anything she would have picked up in the Storm King's army because the build of all his soldiers is that of bipeds. And Tempest's fighting style is definitely a quadruped. So either she took the Storm King's soldiers' styles and adapted it, or she already figured it out before she joined up. But now going back to that beginning area right when she first arrives, I like how they used their evil magical MacGuffin to take out the other three princesses. Well, the thing was, we've already proven in the series that if we want anything to happen, we have to take out the other three princesses first. I'm just saying this is, it was done very well, especially since they gave opportunities for all of them to do something before they got zapped with the magical MacGuffin. Cadence used her powers to protect the two princesses, then got shot. Celestia got to tell Luna to give the exposition for a Twilight Day over here. Luna goes to flee to carry out the orders and is taken while fleeing because Celestia is trying to cover her so that Luna can escape. And then that leaves only Twilight, who basically gets Sonic Rain boomed out of the way. Yeah, and that brings up lots of interesting questions about how the heck did Derpy end up where she was? Because at first I thought Derpy may have actually been the one to save Twilight. But I'm like, I remember seeing a Rainbow Snatcher, so that was Rainbow Dash. But does that mean Rainbow Dash brought Derpy along? Because I didn't see Derpy anywhere near there. Yes, and if Derpy just happened to accidentally get caught in the beam, wouldn't the hat also have been transformed? Because at first I thought it was a Pegasus statue that Rainbow Dash put in the way and put the hat on because mm -hmm. she's just that fast, you know, to make it look like an alicorn because the hat was definitely separate. So the question is, would the hat have transformed basically as a piece of clothing or an object a pony is carrying or wearing get transformed by the magic? Mm. Because the princesses had their crowns on, mm -hmm. and those were transformed. So wouldn't a party hat fall in the same category? Yeah. Hmm. So it seemed more like the hat was put on afterwards to make it look more like, oh yes, we did get the princess. Wings, horn, we got the princess. Mm -hmm. Though personally, I like to think that Derpy helped and wasn't taken along by Rainbow Dash, but she actually... Was trying to help and... Because... I think Derpy's a nice pony. Oh, yeah. And not just because the fandom says she is. Yep. Well, in the canon episodes, she's been shown as a very nice, yet clumsy pony. Yes. Yeah, I like the use of those magical MacGuffins. They did a great job because it was a nice substitute and it was a good way to introduce it before they used it near the end, which we'll get to when we actually get to the end. So what do you think about that whole fight scene and everything? It was nice. It was kind of obvious that we needed to take the three princesses out from the beginning because they're too powerful. Twilight's technically the weakest princess, therefore she's the only one we can leave free to develop the rest of the story. But it still brings into question, was Discord going to come to the Friendship Festival? Because it was Twilight's thing, not Fluttershy's thing. Because if he's off in his little area of chaos zone, that would explain why he's not there for the entirety of the movie even though Fluttershy's in trouble. Mm-hmm, because that's a real big question right there. I know we need the plot and everything, but Discord, Starlight Glimmer, Trixie, and the Changeling Army are all available. <laughs> so, seriously, why weren't Starlight Glimmer, Trixie Luna Moon, Discord, and at least some of the Changelings fighting back in Canterlot, even if it was, you know, behind the scenes, subterfuge, you know, sneaking through and not overt attacks. You know, because Changeling army, especially with the brother of Thorax leading them, probably are trained back up again. Also, Discord snapping his fingers. Trixie doing stuff that the other people don't expect, not using real magic or using a little bit of real magic to augment tricks. When you have an, an army expecting to fight magic, and it's not real magic, they kind of get tripped up. Very much so. And then you have 
Starlight Glimmer, who is like the second most powerful unicorn. And considering that Twilight's now an alicorn, she may actually be the most powerful unicorn. So she probably could have gone toe to toe with Tempest yeah. in terms of straight magic. Not in fighting, but in straight magic. Especially since Starlight's been shown to be really good at attack magic. She relies on that. Yes, attack magic and manipulation magic. What better thing to do than to instantly turn the army against the Storm King and Tempest? Mm-hmm. So that's the only thing they didn't explain away? Though I don't think they're used to having to explain away those kind of characters. They're used to, oh yeah, we got the princesses taken care of, we don't have to worry about anything else interfering with our plot. Except that you guys did that last time, and when you took out all four princesses, we had those characters. Specifically those characters. Mm-hmm. So you've now set us up for the fact that we have this whole entire menagerie of other characters we can now pull from that are just as powerful as the main six and are able to take on incredibly difficult situations like that. Mm-hmm. Because you bet your bottom dollar that Starlight would have gone straight to the Changeling Horde and going, the sea is under attack. And she would have winked there. Yes. She's been shown to have enough power to go from Cantalot to where the Changelings are. In the matter of just doing a few winks and not be exhausted at the end of it. So that was very frustrating to me because even if Discord wasn't present and they couldn't figure out how to get to Discord, you still had Starlight and Trixie in the city. That's a lot right there, just the two of them, without even running for the Changeling Horde. Mm hmm Because like I said, even though Trixie's not physically, magically powerful, the fact that she uses tricks would have really given her an advantage in that situation. Yeah, because the thing is, she's clever and she's good at distractions. It's a very useful skill set. Did we mention we liked the movie? Yes, we liked the movie. We just like it enough to go, here's the flaws. And speaking of which, we should actually get back to the actual movie, not going, you know, these characters would have been really neat. Mm -hmm. But that was another thing of, okay, so they all went over the waterfall. That's kind of classic. And three pegasi in the group, counting Twilight as having wings. And once again, winking, they knew they needed to go through the Badlands. And Twilight's trying to take on all this responsibility. Not that she didn't need her friends, but it would have been a lot faster for her to start winking her way along the Badlands. And even if she couldn't wink all the way there, because I'm not sure you can wink when you don't know the territory, at least line of sight, especially out in the desert. Though I do like how after they were through going through the Badlands and how crazy Pinkie Pie was starting to go, how more crazy Pinkie Pie was starting to go. The moment they were like, city, she's like, I'm normal again. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and also everyone instantly looked normal again. It's like, oh yeah, we're not tired anymore. We're not thirsty. We're not hungry. We're fine. We're in a city. Mm -hmm. Even though it's a very, whoa, we are not an Equestria city. Yeah, I also like rarities. Like, oh, this, this, and a spa. <laughs> we're trying to save the world. There's always time for the spa. I can multitask. Ask. Uh, and that's another thing, like, outside of Equestria, who would you ask? I know they're specifically going to the Hippogriffs, but could you ask other people outside of Equestria? How do other people care about Equestria? Because that wasn't really tackled much in this movie, because it was kind of weird. The people in the city seem to recognize ponies and not be shocked by ponies, but they also acted like they didn't quite know about multicolored ponies, especially when the cat Trickster was able to use the fact that they were multicolored to come up with a distraction and scheme to get rid of all these extra people so he could take them and sell them to a circus. Yes, well, I have a feeling that maybe they're used to seeing regular ponies, perhaps not even intelligent ponies, mm. perhaps actual animals. Because part of the problem was their color scheme, because they were so brightly colored and everyone else there was much duller in color. And that was another thing that the movie seemed to do with its animation, was it was telling you who was important and who was on the pony side, ultimately, by the color scheme. Because mm. out of everyone in 
the Badlands town, only Capper was brightly colored. He was still in browns, but he was more brightly colored than anybody else in the town. Yeah, he definitely stood out from everyone. And that actually talk about an actual song from the movie other than the one we skipped in the intro, which was nice. It was very well done. Yeah, the whole, we got this, you got this. Mm-hmm. Going on to his song, I thought his song was kind of weak. It was sung nicely, but to me, it felt more like one of those talky songs. It was more of a talking song, kind of like um, Be Prepared is more spoken than sung. But the advent of the song gave the audience the opportunity to see the level of manipulator and trickster he was, not just in the honest, in air quotes, helping the ponies out, but we see him do other things throughout the course of the song. Secret alleyways, bribes, theft, secret mm -hmm. communications. Rolling out the red carpet to butter up people. Mm-hmm. Quite literally, and being so charming. And I love how Twilight's the only one not taken in because you see the others falling into the rhythm of the music with the way they're moving. So he's almost like Pied Piper that he's charming them into following him. Mm, yeah, that's a really good catch. That, that probably is a reference because he was literally leading them out of the town into danger, as it were. Yes. Though I do like how... Charming he was, and Spike was like, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, apparently Spike and Twilight were the only ones who had alarms going off that, yeah. Though I think Spike's was more of jealousy. If he didn't have that jealousy, I have a feeling Spike would have gone just right in with it. Well, the problem was he was being charming to Rarity. Now we get up to a point where I think this was one of the first parts where I think you may have felt it was starting to be a little rushed, because to me it felt a little rushed on... How quickly he started to turn around right after Rarity. Because it was only one good deed she did for him, which was repairing his shirt and adding some buttons. Yes, she repaired the cuff of the sleeve and she replaced a button. As a simple thank you with no expectation of anything else. I do like his reaction there where he was like, what? Wait, what? Why are you doing this for me? Don't do it for me. I'm not going to pay you. Basically was his internal reaction. And so what's the catch? And she's like, what catch? Can't a person just thank someone else? And he's like, okay. Um, hmm. Now how am I going to pay them back? Because I am about to sell them. Hmm. Mm hmm And for that one small deed to be enough to lie to Tempest? Though I have a feeling he doesn't like the Storm King's minions that much anyways. Pretty much a given, I would think, because that type of tight army is uh, bad for commerce. But I see he's also more of a chaotic neutral character. It's less that he was evil and more of, oh, I see a way to settle my debt. And then he started to see them slightly as individuals and was starting to feel bad about it. It was a nice touch that was him specifically looking at the button where he changed his story to Tempest mid-sentence. Because he was going to go, oh yeah, they're going to Mount Eris. No problem at all. Mm-hmm. Because he's a chaotic neutral, which means out for yourself. All your stuff is for yourself. And he was like, mm, I think I can get away with lying here. Because mm -hmm. I was like, well, they, she did do that for me. So I'll do this for her. <laughs> Doesn't seem a very even exchange. No. Though considering he was kind of indebted to them because he was going to sell them. Mm-hmm. That may have been the other thing. It's like, Ah, I was going to sell them, so this is uh, me apologizing for that. Of course, then he gets taken along for the ride. Mm -hmm. Well, he had to get taken along for the ride because we needed the new characters for the final act. And then we cut over to stowaways and being found on a pirate ship, nonetheless. Which should have still meant you were getting thrown overboard. Yeah, I think they were going to get thrown overboard, but then... Well, this is actually more important because god dang these rules. No, but I'm saying that even without the Storm King's rules, which said that stowaways get thrown overboard, as pirates, they probably would have thrown them overboard. Yeah. But this gave a great opportunity for a joke there. Yes. Grr, we are about to... Lunch break. I love the direct cut there from 
I believe it was Rainbow Dash, looking, and then it cuts directly to her with the same expression at the dinner table going, huh? The lunch table going, huh? And not only that, they were feeding the ponies. As soon as lunch is over, you're going to throw them overboard. Why are you wasting supplies? Yeah. They seem awfully nice for pirates. Well, they were the cool pirate version, kind of more like the Indiana Jones version, you know, where you're not really stealing treasure, you're finding treasure. Yeah, especially when they kick over to the song and they start talking about how they find their treasure and how it's... There was some other stuff in there that was really nice, how they were basically like, yeah, we're not taking treasure, we're just kind of extended borrowing it. Because we wanted the pirates to be kind of good. Mm -hmm. At the very least against the Storm King and more of a rebel band, like Robin Hood style. I think they were kind of more of a Robin Hood pirate thing. They didn't say specifically that they were giving their treasure away later, but they did say that they kept their treasure and some other stuff. I can't really remember the specific. I'm going to have to watch it again once it comes out on DVD, Blu-ray, digital. That particular song felt very much like a parallel to the first Equestria Girls movie, yes, I'm admitting it exists because I need it for the reference, where they're in the cafeteria singing and handing out the tails and headbands. It has that very much let's join together, let's pump ourselves up vibe to it. I feel this one was way better handled than that one too, especially since I was like, ooh, I really like this song. In the way the movie went, it felt like the songs were almost their own magical MacGuffin, because at the end of a song, something changes. Mm-hmm. Songs in the MLP are usually used for exposition anyways. But that brings me to another point, since we're now on to the second set of new characters that we interact with. At this point, it wasn't really flowing smoothly and transitioning smoothly for me. I felt more like I was watching a miniseries than watching a movie. It felt like there were hard breaks in there. Almost like they planned for when they're going to release it on television for the TV broadcast or when they would actually break it up and show it as a miniseries prior to season eight starting. Yeah, it was one of the things I first noticed about it. It's like there are set piece transitions between locations and stuff like that, but it feels like the story stopping and starting with each introduction of each set of new characters. It felt more like instead of going through an RPG story arc that we were playing Super Mario and warping from one area to another and there wasn't really a connection between the previous world and the current world. Just to point out again for anyone who may talk about it in the comments, there are connections between each section, but they're more set piece connections like I mentioned before, meaning that yes, there are visual connections between each point. There's usually a indicator of where we're going next in each scene artistic wise, but it felt like the story story was jumping from point to point instead of slowly transitioning to here to here like they were mentioning set pieces like oh yes you need an airship to get to this location we know an airship's coming up next oh look there's the airship off into the distance so that's what i'm talking about mm -hmm. and since i think we're probably wrapping up the pirate segment let's bring up the sonic rainbow because <laughs> You mean the signal flare? Yes, because this was where Twilight was getting frustrated with her friends. In the Borderlands town, Pinkie Pie betrayed them by being her normal self and basically doing what she did with Cranky Doodle and go, Has anyone seen this donkey's wig? This donkey is really bald! And then Rainbow Dash going, Okay, finishing touch, we need a sonic rainbow. Which, wouldn't that have rocked the airship? Considering how close she set it off to the airship? Yeah, though, based on at least the visual effect of it, realistically it would go out in a 360 radius, but because of how the Sonic Rainbow is rendered, I'm thinking it might be only in a single axis. So the shockwave may not be going out from it because the Rainbow was right in front of the ship and radiated outwards in a ring, not a sphere. So I'm thinking the pirate ship didn't get the full blast. Yes, but there's the second thing of... Toilet being like, no, 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 don't do this. Which leads up to Twilight's actions when we meet the third set of people because she's already seen her friends acting like they would in Equestria and have it go horribly wrong. Perceived to be going horribly wrong. 
because doing that whole thing with the pirates set up the pirates so they would be more loyal to them later. Yes, but that was more the song. The Sonic Rainboom was a finishing touch that probably could have been done without. So since you brought it up, moving on to the Sea Pony slash Hippogriff segment, that's the first point in the movie where I was like, oh, I don't like where this is going. And not in the, oh, something really bad's gonna happen, but the more of the, oh, she's going to do something so utterly stupid. How are the writers gonna get themselves out of this corner? Yes, uh, starting with where they first almost run into the young Hippogriff princess. She's singing in that flower above water. So are the sea pony form of the Hippogriffs able to come above water like that? Or did she actually have the ability to change back and forth from Hippogriff to sea pony? And if she could do that, oh my goodness, why hasn't her mother like stuck her on a leash in the throne room? Yeah. Though I think the whole setup was supposed to also mirror the whole relationship between King Trident and Ariel. A little bit of, you know, the whole surface dweller thing and instant trust and... Except it seems like everything that the princess was bringing back was a shell because her mother was like, I don't need to see another shell. So apparently she collects a lot of shells. But we don't see her clearly. All we see is the golden glow. But that's clearly above water because she's in the flower. So either the sea ponies have the ability to be above water or she can shift back and forth. I almost want to say she can shift back and forth because that same glow was also used later when she came out of the water to talk to Twilight's friends. Yes, in her hippogriff form. Because she didn't steal the pearl, so how would she be able to transform herself from sea pony to hippogriff while leaving the pearl behind, and then as hippogriff get all the way to the surface? The only way that would work is if she did the air bubble trick on herself, and then swam all the way out and managed to sneak all the way past all the guards and all the other sea ponies in hippogriff form. Nobody would pay attention if she was in sea pony form, but everyone would notice if she was in hippogriff form. Going back to that one point, I think the only reason it works for Twilight's character at this point is because she's overthinking things as usual like she thinks okay the stuff I do in Equestria to get friends isn't going to work out here because it's not Equestria also I am the only princess all the responsibilities are on me whenever she gets in that mindset she starts making mistake after mistake after mistake yes she does and it's just so frustrating because you're a princess you're talking to another princess here we have a queen we finally have a queen who is not evil because so far the only other queen we've had is Queen Chrysalis. And so here we have a princess who is technically your equal and a queen who by traditional hierarchy would be above you. You asked them for help, they declined, and your answer was theft. With very little justification. Like Gen 1 searching out the Golden Horseshoes justification for Megan after Wind Whistler loses the race. Because they say, these guys cheated because they knew they would win. They knew they would win because they looked at the forecast in the Golden Horseshoe. They didn't know they would win because they cheated. So it's very weak logic to justify what the person wants to do. She had like no belief in her friends at this point. Like, Twilight, you've done this song and dance before. <laughs> You're like seven seasons into friendship isn't always easy, but it's worth fighting for and having faith in your friends and their individual abilities and making allowances for mistakes. But instead of taking time to try and earn the help of the Hippogriff Sea Ponies, you decide that you should take what you want. And even that, I was hoping even with her stealing it, that it would go differently because the hippogriff queen was kind enough to transform them into the sea pony form which was safer for them to be underwater than the air bubble spell and you know let them be there even though she was refusing to allow the pearl to go she was actually kind enough to also say you can stay here for as long as you want this is a safe place you're you can stay which would have given them the time not only to earn 
the queen's help, but to think of other plans. It's like, okay, we're finally in a safe place where Tempest and the Storm King can't get us. Let's think of another plan now that we have breathing room. Yeah, and I thought they may have gone another direction with a betrayal for Twilight. Instead of her stealing the pearl, Twilight would sit for too long thinking about how to solve things, and the Storm King and his troops would actually follow them all the way underneath the water. And that would be the betrayal because the Queen would go like, you led them here. It's your fault. Yes, that was one of the things that I was expecting. But when I knew that Twilight was going to steal the pearl, I was hoping that she'd actually get away with it. I was hoping that she would steal the pearl, leave her friends behind, and take the pearl and leave. Because her friends were innocent. And because she was already hurting and feeling that they had failed her, leaving them behind in a safe place while she shouldered all the responsibility of saving Equestria would have fallen a bit more in character and almost would be more noble. I think this is the only thing I really had trouble with in the movie. And I had trouble enjoying that song because I knew what was going on in the background. Same here. This would have been, if we were watching this in a medium where we could have paused it, I would have paused it repeatedly at this point because it's like, I know how this is going to end and it's not going to be pretty. And I think another reason that I pause at these kind of cringe moments is because not only do I know it's coming, but as a storyteller myself, I'm like, you guys are painting yourselves into a corner. This is a really bad corner. I Because I know what you want to do after this corner. You want the sea ponies to be their allies. But this is a real bad thing Twilight's about to do. I mean, horrible, bad thing. How do you get them to forgive her after you do this? Because she's not just stealing something. She's stealing the object that is keeping their entire kingdom safe. This is like going to the Flutter Ponies and stealing the Sunstone. Which, by the way, is what the villains did in the series. Not the good guys. Also, I'd like to point out some similarities, uh, sea ponies and flutter ponies to the hippogriff um, turned sea ponies. Hmm. So Lux and I were talking a little bit like how they didn't fit any sea pony music chords into the sea pony section, which makes sense because they're not actually sea ponies. Hippogriffs are now canon, not sea ponies. But the dance number took some cues from the sea pony dance number from the Gen 1 pilot story hmm. because they had the bubbles and some manipulation of bubbles also the coordinated dancing of the background sea ponies and those being more color coordinated than being individual ponies you'll notice that really only the queen and the princess were individualized and if you look at the dance sequence it's all by color scheme so that they're making pretty colored patterns, which is what the sea ponies do in the Gen 1 pilot story. And now that we're actually talking about the number, I thought it was really well done. It's my next favorite song in the entire movie, especially since it's a nice little thing of, I do one small thing for you. I don't expect anything from it, but you can choose to do one small thing for me because it's one small thing that starts anything. A single step. Yes, a single step, a single grain of sand, Small things can build into large things because we have these small things and then we kept doing these small things and it built and suddenly it's a big thing and suddenly we've made a difference. And it's just that the message of that story was all the more painful because of what Twilight was doing in the background of betraying her place as Princess of Friendship. And not just betraying the sea ponies, but betraying her friends. And I think that's the real crutch, the real problem that made both of us go, I can't enjoy the song. Because she didn't let her friends in on what she was doing. So her friends were completely innocent. And because they were completely innocent, it hurt all the more. And if Twilight thought that what she was doing was truly a good idea, she should have been able to share it with her friends. And that could have been better than what they did because they would have tried to talk her out of it. And the Hippogriff Sea Pony Kingdom could have observed that fight and perhaps only have exiled Twilight. And then while her friends are behind, her friends could plead on her behalf. 
But we should probably move on. Because I think yeah. we've talked over that point just enough to really cover what we really wanted to point out about and why it rubbed us the wrong way. Yes, but also with their exile from the Sea Pony Kingdom, the whole you don't deserve to be one of us, at what point were they transformed back to sea ponies and why did the queen still allow them to leave? Because they knew the secret of where the sea ponies were. So you don't trust them enough to let them stay there, but you trust them enough to kick them out where they can betray your location. Honestly, she should have transformed them back into ponies, kept them on the bubble spell, and locked them up. Because, you know, we can't actually kill anyone. Except when we turn them into stone. But that's the thing to point out at the end. Now moving on to that scene above the water, with Twilight going off on Pinkie Pie, of all people. Yeah. And Twilight being the one to fracture the friendship with her angry words, and also justifying her unkind behavior by saying we're not in Equestria, the rules aren't the same. I wish that would have been pointed out earlier. Because they never really did anything to make Twilight think that outside Equestria the rules are different. She just assumed that the rules were different. And I wish we would have pointed that out more. Like when they first got to the first town, her saying, guys, the rules are different here. And them saying, I don't know about that, Twilight. You know, to give some contrast between those two thoughts. Because we can really only infer it by Twilight saying, Guys, let's try to keep a low profile and not draw attention to ourselves. Which would make sense even if they were in Equestria, because they're on an important mission that may or may not be secretive. So, ouch. Yes, but they had to get Twilight away from the others, because the others would still defend her at this point. So we needed her alone, air quotes alone, sorry Spike, so that she could be captured. Mm -hmm. What we need is actually Twilight and Spike to be alone together so Spike could be freed and run off and inform the others. Also, they did an amazing job at using Spike's fire as an actual weapon. Yes, because he both burned himself free from the Storm King soldier and used his fire as a decoration when he was on the cake and used him literally as a flamethrower. Thank you, Capper. Mm-hmm. You're a fire-breathing dragon, right? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, though him being a dragon kind of brings up the question going back to the desert. Why was he suffering as much as the ponies? Considering we've seen him belly flop into hot lava? Yeah. Also, wouldn't the ponies have tried to take some supplies with them before crossing into a desert? Because can't you see when a desert starts? Mm -hmm. And there's towns outside of Canterlot you could have gone to relatively quickly because so far they only captured the capital. Which means that the outlying villages, any village to the south of Canterlot would have been a place to pick up supplies. But nope. But back to that scene, that was, a, I guess, a really good use of the fire. I like how the other ponies were sitting there going, well, do you think it's about time? I mean, do I like really did it to us? And we still like her, but... Are we ready to talk about it? Because Pinkie Pie doesn't come up and say, I don't want to be friends anymore. She goes, I can't talk to you right now. Which is a reasonable reaction. It's like, I'm hurt, so I don't want to lash back out. So I can't talk to you right now. You know, because she's been friends with her so long that, and she also knows how Twilight can get so in her head. But at that particular moment, the emotions were too high. She's like, especially how emotional Pinkie Pie actually is extremely emotional and actually extremely vulnerable to being hurt by her friends. She was like, nope, I can talk to you later, but right now I need to go somewhere and think and calm down so I don't make the situation any worse. Which is actually a very reasonable and adult response. Though I think I skipped over the Tempest song there. I felt like you did a little bit, but since we're talking about them all going, oh yeah, we should probably go talk to her, and then Spike running up, she's been taken, she's been taken, we could... Go straight into the Tempest song, which is a really good song, and it was a good way to do the story exposition for her backstory, but I'm not quite sure how well it fit at that particular moment. Is It's a rather awkward time for the two of them to be communicating, because... Tempest already has Twilight captured. She doesn't need Twilight to change sides. 
because Twilight's in the cage. It's already been proven Twilight can't break out of the cage. And Twilight's cooperation is not required to obtain the magic. Because if cooperation was required, we wouldn't have turned the others to stone and stolen the magic that way. I think, like you said, it may be a little late for her to change sides, but I think Tempest was still trying to change her sides because she wanted someone else with her. Not as a friend, but as a more powerful lackey after she overthrew the Storm King. But what would be the point of cultivating Twilight? Because Twilight's magic would already be surrendered. Hmm. So what's the advantage of courting a powerless princess? Figurehead to help get anyone else that may still be resistant? Like, one of your princesses is on my side. Everything is okay. Which is a classic villain tactic for the ones who work in the shadows. Though going back to talking about the cage, the only thing they didn't show Twilight trying to do to get out of that cage was winking. I was like waiting for her to try that. I'm like, Dude, it's just a cage. It may be able to absorb magic that way, but who says it blocks teleportation? Yeah, winking is highly underutilized in this series all overall. So other than it feeling a little awkwardly placed for you, what did you think about the song? I like the song. It was very expressive of where Tempest stood. It gave us the opportunity for the flashback of when she was initially hurt. It was so frustrating. That's where I really was like, I want to see the progression after that point because we see her having fun we see her getting hurt we see her friends being frightened of what her horn does after it's damaged and moving on and making a different unicorn friend and her walking out of the village and that's it yeah i wish they would have like somehow showed it that as she walked off they showed a hint of the storm king in that last shot with her walking into the dark forest like he was at least watching her or something, just a hint that, oh yeah, this is where she's leading. Even though we know she's there, we want to know when she ended up there. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to know if she ever actually got a cutie mark. Because the Storm King outfit that she wears throughout the entirety of the film covers her flank. And the flashback doesn't have a cutie mark. So it appears that she was injured before she obtained her cutie mark. And this is especially interesting considering we recently watched the episode with Rumble. So does she actually have a cutie mark now or doesn't she? And should we say what her real name is for the end or should we mention it right now? Let's go ahead and mention it right now. I don't think I remember enough to say it even though we looked at it just before this recording. Yeah, but that was what, over an hour ago? <laughs> Fizzle Pop Berry Twist. I love her name. And it surprisingly fits well with her color scheme because she's kind of berry colored mm -hmm. and she creates fireworks her, her power may even have been to make small fireworks when she was younger because um levitation seems to be a basic spell that every unicorn seems to pick up on yeah so basic unicorn magic seems to be simple levitation but everyone else seems to have a magic specialty within that so hers could have been fireworks and not that the name is always reflective of the cutie mark and the ability because hello you get named when you're born mm -hmm. and you don't get your cutie mark till your more formative years so yeah i think the name works well for what her powers are and so does tempest because she certainly has a stormy personality so let's see yeah we have the friends we have the classic all the friends showing up that you've met throughout the movie showing up and going okay let's kick some tail yes and i love how everyone's getting excited at capper's description and they're like guys calm down he's talking about us <laughs> oh <laughs> i love how it was applejack too and i also love at the very end spike goes so are there any other friends that we made along the way that are going to show up they're like is this really all the friends we made because we need way more than this you didn't, but it would have been nice. And going back to that one talking up thing, I th I almost thought he was going to be talking about the pirates. I was like, he could be talking about the pirates, but I'm like, he's totally talking about them. Because the main six wouldn't have known that the pirates escaped from Tempest. They don't even know that the pirates needed to escape because they didn't know that the pirates protected them to the very end. And they didn't know that Capper protected them at all. And this particular part actually makes sense 
that it was the rest of the main six that got the rest of them together? Because they were the ones who actually made friends with all these people along the way. Not Twilight. Yeah, Twilight didn't really befriend any of them. So this was a friend of a friend helping a friend. Showing just how far the connections of friendship can go. No, they saved Twilight for making friends with Tempest. And this brings up a thing that could have been a nice reference to the Changeling army, Starlight and Trixie. When we cut back to the palace, there could have been freedom fighting going on, like Changelings on the outside. We could have seen in the background transforming because their magic is very identifiable. So we wouldn't even have to have any detail what they look like. We could have just seen the green magic in the background of a thing suddenly changing color. And we could have just had a report or something just being in the background to let us know that, oh yeah, there are other people fighting that we know exists in the Pony world that would have defended Equestria. Yes, because basically it looks like all of the town surrendered and nobody escaped. And just going back to Storm King again, he just seems so incompetent. It's like, how did this guy ever get in charge of anything? Even though he could act incompetent, we should have seen points of clarity where he gets stuff done and really manipulates people and not just yeah 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 because he does that a lot yeah 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 that's not how you manipulate people no that's how you show that you're not good at manipulating people but you manipulated tempest you have all these soldiers following your orders you subdued pirates and made them your delivery crew though going back to that real quick when Tempest boards the pirate ship, I was hoping there would be a sign of recognition in the pirates of like, <gasps> because it seems Tempest has been the one doing everything for the Storm King. So it would have been a nice, oh. Mm, the stakes are a little higher than we thought they were. They do have a reaction of like how powerful she is, but it doesn't, it's not a reaction of recognition. It's a reaction of, oh, this is a powerful person working for the Storm King. Yeah, where it seems like it would have made more sense to, oh, this is Tempest again. Mm-hmm. Because I think Tempest is the only one that really has any power of getting people to follow her compared to the Storm King. So I would have been okay with that, but we should have shown more actual manipulation of Tempest by the Storm King to show that he only needs to manipulate her. I know we got the carrot of getting her horn back, but he's done enough that that carrot is more of a baby carrot, not a full-grown carrot. Yeah, and we only see it the one time of, remember, I'm the only one who can restore your horn. We don't see that he's shown enough competence for Tempest to actually believe that. Mm -hmm. He's shown a lot of, he's not competent enough to do anything. I mean, he showed to be more kid-like than anything. Especially once he gets that power, he's like, ooh, ooh, pretty, 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 pretty. So it's really not believable. He's not a very believable character for the role that he's been cast in. Because to do what he's done, he needs to be a master manipulator. And a master manipulator wouldn't have slipped even after getting the power. They would have found an excuse to delay the horn restoration to keep Tempest on a leash mm -hmm. instead of instant betrayal. He was so kid-like. It almost makes you wonder if he was a kid, kind of like that episode of the classic TMNT series where they were dealing with this all-powerful creature and then they find out it's a child? Mm-hmm. And April O'Neil going, yeah, I just took the batteries out of it. <laughs> But yeah, that's what it felt like now that I've really thought about it through this discussion we've had on the movie. He was very childlike and more of a spoiled child who got a lot of stuff, who happens to have a lot of power of, I get my way. But that doesn't give him the power of getting his way. Yeah, it's more like the prince from Never Ask for a Gucci Bird, that he's only getting this stuff because he's the prince. We don't see any actual power displayed by him now moving on a little bit that whole scene with the betrayal and the lead up and there's little bits that really lead up to tempest doing a 180 because there's what twilight says within earshot of tempest of like friendship didn't fail me 
but I failed friendship. That was within earshot of Tempest, so that's another earwig that got into her head. Not to mention her friend showing up anyways. Mm -hmm. And then you have Twilight saving her when she's being blown away by the storm. And say, and her going, why are you doing this? And Twilight going, this is what friends do. I'm like, yeah, Twilight, you guys haven't really had enough between you to justify that comment. But I think Twilight said it to also to herself. It was more of a to herself than to Tempest. It was like, I haven't been a friend. So now I need to be a friend. And you're nearby and you need help. So I think it fits better that way that it's a Twilight reaffirming something to herself than saying it directly to Tempest. Because to me, Tempest's 180 is more believable than the Hippogriff Princess. Though I think the Hippogriff Princess didn't really blame Twilight. She was saddened by what Twilight did. And she didn't blame the friends either because I think she also realized that the friends weren't in on this at all. They looked just as upset as we were when the whole thing happened. So I think that's what really gave the Hippogriff Princess a reason to act because she looked at Twilight's friends and looked at how hurt they were that what Twilight did. And she could have also been observing them on the shoreline. She could have followed them and been listening because she was surprisingly lonely for a princess. I mean, all those other Hippogriff sea ponies were there, but apparently she was still incredibly lonely. I think it's one, because she's the princess, and two, I think she enjoyed being above ground more than she does below ground. Once again, that kind of Little Mermaid hint. Since we're talking about the people who eventually help the rest of the main six, I like the classic cake. I was just about to say we needed to double back to that. The classic Trojan horse ploy. Also, we get to actually see more manipulation by the trickster. He's like, all right, well, well, why don't you go tell the Storm King that he's not getting his congratulatory cake because I don't want to, I don't want to be the one to do it. Also, you guys aren't letting me in, so I can't be the one to go tell him. Mm -hmm. And I love how people are like, it's not working. And he's like, yeah, he's, he has his back and he's like, three, two, one. He's used that particular con multiple times. Well, it's usually a highly effective con with underlings because underlings don't want to get in trouble with their boss. And speaking of underlings, I like how their cover was blown by an underling going, I can't resist cake. So it's actually a good lead up that he's always after sweets. Mm hmm. And this entire time is like, oh, yeah, he likes food. He has his pie, but he's like, ooh, yeah, I'd rather have cake. Goodbye, pie. Hello, cake. Don't mind if I do. Ooh, who puts eyeballs in cakes? And then he's grabbed into the cake. Mm -hmm. And then, ah, cover's blown! Also, Pinkie Pie blowing their cover by looking too happy in captivity. God, that's going to be a whole fandom subset right there. Pinkie happy to be in chains. Yeah, it's probably already out there, so it's just going to reinforce that. Yeah. Not to mention the other fuel in this movie for fanfics, but I'll mention that later. So, that fight scene was just... Awesome. A couple of awesome points are Pinkie Pie, the whole present slash cupcake kind of flinging thing where, here's a present! Uh, ooh, uh. <laughs> yes, because she hands him the box, and somehow she is then inside the box. Mm -hmm. They do an awesome job in this movie of using her teleportation abilities. Yes, her Pinkie Pie fourth wall, whatever you want to call it, abilities. And then Fluttershy. For a second, I thought she was just going to get away with sad eyes and winning. But instead, mm. she offers empathy of, do you want to talk about it? Uh, though, speaking of this fight scene, it reminds me of when they were falling out of the blimp and a mirror falls past Rarity. That was so Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. And I love how she like pauses, <laughs> make sure she's whole, and then, okay, I'm good. Oh! <laughs> I'm surprised, didn't, I'm surprised the drama couch wasn't falling with her. I know, really. It, just her falling on a fainting couch would have been awesome. Mm -hmm. But apparently there wasn't a fainting couch on the ship. Mm. Also, I loved Rainbow Dash's reaction of being caught in Twilight's magic. Like, I have wings, Twilight. <laughs> Speaking of people who have wings, I love Fluttershy. Oh, I can't watch this! <laughs> <laughs> and sorry we're all over the place, people. It's just the way we think. 
Lux did try to make it linear in the beginning, but I'm like, I know we're not going to be linear. I'm not really going to try much. We usually don't talk much about like, oh yeah, this, and then we jump back to where we are, which is that wonderful fight scene. I just love how as Fluttershy walks off going, oh, I'm sorry, time's up. He's like, no. Well, to me, it felt more like a, a goodbye way. At first he was surprised, and I loved the whole, oh, our time's up. It's like, yes, your session is ended for today. Uh, and then the stuff that happens inside the castle and throne room. And I was expecting, like, when um, during the whole scene where they were trying to get the rod after it was blasted through the window, I expected the Storm King and the main six to be reaching for it. But I almost expected Tempest to be the one to grab it before anything happened. Kind of like in Kim Possible in the episode where the powers of Shigo's siblings are all stolen and she gets the staff first and starts using all the powers, the underling cutting above the top villains and leaving Tempest to make that decision. Mm hmm. Because it would have cut to the Storm King going, Give it back to me, and Twilight going, No. <laughs> Please, Tempest, don't do this. Mm -hmm. But I do like what happens right after that. When Twilight comes back after calming down the storm. Thank you for the heavenly imagery there. Mm -hmm. I like how we now see Tempest where Tempest was. And I like the fact that we see the Storm King again crawling up the side. And just as he's about to do something, she goes no and the main six react as if she was going to attack her because they don't know about the transformation yet. And I like the use of the magical MacGuffin in this case instead of the main six getting a magical MacGuffin. The bad guy's magical MacGuffin gets turned against them. Which is a very nice touch and also means we didn't have to introduce any new powers for the movie. But it was nice to see that her friends are back willing to defend her. And then Tempest just goes right past them and goes for the Storm King. Also... I found it interesting that after all of Twilight's powers were taken into the staff, she still had the levitation ability to keep Tempest from falling. She was using the staff. Because I was like looking at the color of the magic as she was pulling Tempest back. I was like, that's not Twilight's color. I know. I'm like, that's not quite right. She was using the staff's magic because she didn't have any magic left. So that was a nice little touch there. And when Tempest comes back, I was like, what? I, I'm alive? Because she expected to die. At the very least, she expected to be in stone forever. She's like, I'm alive? And then Toilet going, so, shall we solve this? And leading up to Tempest to do the final reversal. Yeah, of kind of a whole, so, now what? Now we fix everything. <laughs> mm-hmm. I almost expected someone to go, and now we rebuild. Because you're going to have to do a lot of rebuilding, because, oof, Canterlot, the Hippogriff Empire, I should say the Hippogriff Kingdom. Mm -hmm. But apparently just sticking the staff in the ground upside down and all the magic coming back was enough to repair the castle because it was going back through and restoring all the architecture and restoring the color to the city. And the one thing I thought we might get out of this, especially before restoring the power to the four princesses, was actually restoring Tempest's horn. I thought that the good guys might be able to give her what the villains only promised. Though I do like the fact that Twilight in a way did give back her horn. Just not in a literal sense. And I like the whole end party, how it was at night, how um, it didn't have any of the special effects Twilight wanted, but it still went off magnificently. Though that reminds me of a quite funny part during the song at the beginning of the movie where Spike was eating the gems. <laughs> and how Rarity just had like a whole little gift basket for him like, here, please leave the ones that I'm using to decorate alone, but I'm not going to make you starve. And the animation just really showed off at the end there because of all those nice special effects. The ponies dancing was very well animated. Both the support dancers and the general audience. And the background characters and the new characters. And I love the whole, ah, uh, you are so grounded for so long. <laughs> Yeah. Hug, you are so grounded. I'm what now? <laughs> like, yes, you did a nice and noble thing. You're still in trouble. Mm hmm And I like how the animation during the credits, how we saw Celestia and the Hippogriff Queen hugging each other and stuff like that. Yes, the 
communicating with each other, giving them each other a bow of equals and then hugging as if they were old friends, which we don't know much about the hippogriffs. Do Are they long lived enough? I mean, look at how long it looked like the city had been abandoned. Mm -hmm. That was a long period of time for them to be sea ponies and for her to still be the same queen. That also brought up another thing of like, why didn't Twilight name drop? Seriously. Yeah, like I'm from Equestria, name drop. Celestia sent me to get you because Equestria got taken over by the Storm King. Celestia, Equestria got taken over, Storm King. Name drop like crazy at that point. Yes, Celestia was going to send her sister, Luna, Luna. to you, but Luna was captured. I was the only one left from Equestria to come on Celestia's behalf. <laughs> I'm doing hand gestures, I apologize. <laughs> And he has to remind me that it's radio. I remind myself that it's radio. Just sometimes I forget because I am such a talker with me hands. Yeah, and going on to the spot that I was like, oh yeah, fan fiction fuel here. The whole interactions between Twilight and Tempest at this point are very kind of, yeah, I like you. Yeah, I like you. People would pick it up as that. Not just, yeah, I'm sorry for being such a jerk. Can we be friends now? Yeah, yeah, we should probably start to doing that. But a lot of fans would go, shipping fuel, I am going to write a long fanfic about those two making out. <laughs> they were on the same screen together, that's all you need. <laughs> I know, but this whole section really reinforces that. It's not just, I looked in your general direction, now there's 50 fanfics. <laughs> ah. This is more like, they talked for a long period of time, showing a mild affection for each other. Oh, look, That's isn't obviously it? romantic affection because there's no other kind of affection. affection. So now there's an entire section on film fiction about them. <laughs> and briefly going into Tempest's overall design before we go to the closing credits, I really like her design. I like how while her horn being broken wasn't motivation for her, it wasn't all that her character was about. Also, if you look at her design... Her coloration works very well, both for her given name and her assumed name. And they stayed away from the traditional red and black for villainy. While her shade of purple does have a lot of red in it, it doesn't scream the whole red and black. There's very little black. It's mostly in her costume. And the red's predominantly in her mane. Which coordinates very well with her fur color. Also, I really like the color of her eyes. Though it's interesting, all the main six have more rounded eyes, where hers are more oblong, rather like some of Photo Finish's makeup assistants. Mm hmm. That very kind of nice angular appearance compared to the roundness of the main six and a lot of other ponies in Equestria. Which could be an indicator of what area of Equestria she's from. Also, I like the fact that Saddle Arabia was mentioned again at the beginning of the movie. Yes, and also that Sassy Saddles was there, who looks like she could be from Saddle Arabia based on her overall shape and size design, though Fleur de Lis has a similar body build. And I like how they continued this story and had the epilogue in the credits. Mm -hmm. At least in the first part of the credits, like usual. Yes, I love that we point out that Twilight still can't dance. Yeah, they give her that classic, mm, eh, mm, I can yo! <laughs> Which is exactly the same as she was doing in the episode where Rarity didn't get in trouble for lying. Also, it was funny that someone glued the Storm King back together <laughs> in a very bad way that wasn't even remotely close to how the statue would have glued back together. And interesting timing-wise, because, okay, one's Hasbro, one's Disney, but we recently watched the DuckTales. Okay, also spoilers for DuckTales real quick. We recently watched the pilot and... The gold dragon was turned to stone and then broken, which was the death of an organic creature. And speaking of the DuckTales, we do have a recording on it. We just don't know when exactly it's going to come up because we got this movie, we got the episode, we got I got a lot of stuff to do. <laughs> so yeah, scheduling and time factors as usual. And it gets more difficult as there are more things we really want to post. And it's like, well, where do we fit in extra episodes? Mm. But... The difference between the DuckTales one and this one, the dragon, while a mystical creature and shown to be able to understand speech, 
We don't know how intelligent it is. The Storm King is shown to be a thinking, rational being that we just killed. Though he does have the classic Disney falling death, and he wasn't killed by a good guy at the time. No, because technically he was killed by Tempest. Who was starting to become a good guy. So it was okay for her to kill someone. Especially in the defense of someone else. Yes, because she was doing it as a sacrifice, not as a trying to kill. Because she wasn't trying to kill him. She was trying to block him from throwing the rock thing at Twilight. Okay, as long as this audio recording is, apparently there are things that Lux and I talked about in the many times we talked about the movie before turning on the recordings that I didn't mention. So can any pony explain how Applejack was able to bring the Apple Family Cider all the way to the Friendship Festival, it's canon that they can't even let the rich family sell it in their store, which is within Ponyville boundaries because of compromise of quality between the time they bottle it and the time they sell it. So how is she able to take it all the way to the festival? So should we start to wrap things up with our final thoughts on this? This is almost as long as the movie. Yes! <laughs> Would you like to go first? Enjoyed the movie. See the rest of the episode for the nitpicks. I think they learned a lot from doing the Equestria Girls movies and made a lot of improvements. My main nitpicks are that we didn't account for all the powerful characters that could have come to Equestria's defense and likely would have. And the overall flow, it felt like a series of set pieces loosely tied together, kind of like the Campfire Tales episode, as opposed to a smooth flow of story. It's like they built the breaks in for where they're going to put the commercials when it's broadcast on television. Yes, it was a really enjoyable movie, and we both agree on, like, it felt like a bunch of connected pieces that were still separate. It's like... I'm going to put this piece of tape from here to here on this piece of paper, and then I'm going to connect these two drawings I've already made compared to, oh, I need more room. I'm going to expand this drawing out. So there's that, and the songs were nice. Some of them felt a little out of place, but still enjoyable. And it's a really nice art piece. The art was really well done. There were some places where the ponies did feel separate from the background and not part of the world because of CG, probably not enough time to really blend them together. But this new software they're using for the movie, I hope they can use it for the TV series, because I would love to see season eight like this, because they already completed season seven, so they really can't use the software for, for that. So, and even if they don't, I hope they learn some techniques or are able to use some assets from this and use it in the software they're using for the TV series. Yeah, because we can't expect the TV series to look and have the same production values as a feature film. It's not financially viable, but hopefully they can take some of what they've invested in the film and translate it to the series. And I like Tempest as a character. Some people have said that she stole the movie. Yeah, she her character is the most interesting out of everyone in the movie. Though I still want to know about the Storm King. Not because he's an interesting character, but because they hint at more to him. I do want to know more to make him at least somewhat more dimensional than how flat he was in the movie. Basically, I need to know how he managed to get as far as he is. That's what I need to know. Tempest, I want to know everything. And I do hope we see Tempest and the Hippogriffs in the TV series. I would be okay with just one episode <laughs> for each. It didn't even have to be a full episode. They could go somewhere where we run into her or she helps them in some way or we have to go to the Hippogriffs to help with the Griffins. You know. Something. Yeah. And this has been our thoughts and theories and nitpicks and improvements for My Little Pony the Movie 2017 edition. Thank you for listening. No, seriously, I think this is on record as our longest recording. Our previous record was held by Bravely Default. So if you feel like another marathon, you can go check that one out. Everything else is much shorter. Promise. Pinky promise. Everything else up to this point except that is much shorter. A lot of it's ponies. You, you stayed this far for ponies, so th there's lots of ponies. Also, if you like ponies other than MLP ponies, 
There are ponies and unicorns and pegasi over in Ember's reading room where we look at children's books from an adult as an actual grown up, get your mind out of the gutter, that's what fem fiction's for, perspective. If you enjoy Lux's art, you can find more of it on Twitter, Tumblr, DeviantArt, Google+, Facebook, Reddit, a couple Mastodon servers, and wherever else we or somebody else manages to put it up. Really enjoy Lux's art and would like some of your own? He does take commissions. Check the link below for pricing and availability. Really enjoy this channel and would like to and are able to throw a few bits our way. We, as in Lux, but really us, have a Patreon and a Ko-fi. Patreon starts at a dollar, which now also gets you a monthly sketch and some voting rights. And Coffee works in increments of three. Thank you again for listening. Oh my God, I can't believe you've really listened to this. Even if you skipped sections, thank you so much.